l'honorable député de Hall Elmer, Greg Fergus. Quebec Liberal MP Greg Fergus beat out six other candidates to become the first black person to hold the office of Speaker of the House of Commons. I'm really looking forward to working collaboratively with all of you. We need to make sure that we treat each other with respect. This should be inspiring for all Canadians. It is an incredible achievement to serve in the role uh, that Parliament has bestowed upon you. They're one day going to see your face on the walls of this chamber. There's going to be kids who maybe have come here and not seen themselves reflected on the walls. And that's going to change now. That's very powerful. Here, here. All right, Greg Fergus is a soft-spoken and rather genteel guy. So will his election bring more decorum to the House? Brad, let's get started on that with you. I mean, the contrast between the House of Commons and the House of Representatives yes. today and, and how things went. I mean, Greg Fergus's election, what's the challenge he's got ahead of him? Yeah, he, I, there, there, there are quite many. Uh, the, the first thing I think, obviously, is he's going to need a very good vetting process for when, you know, for the Speaker's Gallery, uh, whenever uh, heads of state from <laughs> yes. other countries come. Uh, un, kind of undoing and kind of fixing uh, the troubles that Mr. Rhoda had uh, as Speaker, I think, is, is, is got to have to be uh, front and center. As for decorum, Lots of speakers run and say, I'm going to bring about decorum. They've been saying that for decades uh, on Parliament Hill. The House is in a different spot right now, though. It's bad energy. In it is. No, it, no, there's no question that it is bad. And it has gotten worse substantially over the last handful of years. Can the speaker him, himself uh, mm. change that? I think there's a limited role. He can set the tone. Uh, but unless he starts throwing people out, and until the day where members of Parliament stop using the theatre of getting kicked out to further their right. fundraising uh, strategies to say, look, I got kicked out of the House of Commons, now, now send me money. And uh, unfortunately, uh, far too many Canadians do that. Look, uh, it's a very exciting day for, for Canada in that the first person of colour is elected Speaker of the House. I, I do not want to change that. But other challenges that Mr. Fergus is going to have. He is a partisan. He used to, you know, he, had, he held positions within the Liberal Party of Canada. He used to be uh, a bit of a pit bull for the Prime Minister. He'd come out and... and, uh, and uh, he was and, his and, Parliamentary Secretary. Do, you know, do the talking points and... And, and, and box on behalf of the Prime Minister. So the relationship that he has with many members of Parliament is going to be a little bit different uh, because of that partisan nature that he's had before. He's going to have to overcome, uh, I think, that, that potentially negative uh, attitudes towards him. Nigam, what's your thoughts on, on Greg Fergus's uh, ascension to the Speaker's chair after, well, well let's face it, it's, it's been a rough few days for the House of Commons. And, uh, you know, I just want to emphasize again the historicness of today. Uh, the reality is, you know, Greg Fergus has been a longtime MP. Um, he's respected in the ways in which I think that, you know, within liberal circles particularly. But I think the most notable event today was when he was elected, uh, the ch biggest cheers came from Quebec, those from the Bloc. I mean, when do you see the Bloc Quebecois MPs rushing to go and congratulate uh, a member of parliament from the Liberal Party. I mean, he's from Quebec, but I think there is kind of an indica indicator that there is a historicness of today. Let's hope that that carries forward. However, I 100% agree that Greg Fergus is a longtime Liberal. He's very partisan. He's run uh, filibuster campaigns uh, to try to stop uh, conversations on committee. Um, he's used uh, tactics that yep. are somewhat questionable that uh, and then on top of that, he's been a liberal for, we're talking three decades, since he's a president of the Young Liberals way back in the 1990s. I mean, the reality is that he's very soft-spoken, and I don't know how you get uh, this decorum back. I don't know how you get the respect back. Um, you know, I hope, I'm trying to think a glass half full on a, on a historic day like this, especially when we look at the rancor of the United States and people turning on themselves in the, in the House and tossing out the Speaker simply because he made an agreement with another party. Um, I hope that, they, uh, that we take a lesson to see that we need to get work done, and particularly for Canadians, and that, uh, that Greg Ferris might be somebody who can sort of help that along in a soft-handed way. Yeah, Michelle, uh, Michelle Nigan makes a really good point there that while soft-spoken, Greg Fergus has been deployed in partisan fashion, obviously as a liberal partisan. It's incumbent on him now, I guess, to rise uh, to, to the esteem of the office and, uh, and show a fair hand. Well, first, I'm so excited for Greg. I, am, I was a young liberal um, with Greg back in university. He's a, he's a dear old friend. And he's also someone who is incredibly even-keeled 
cares passionately about Canada. And let's be honest, every single person who's ever held the office of speaker was a partisan from one party or another. Uh, so, you know, uh, everyone did their part when they were uh, when they were in whatever role they were in. But Greg is somebody who I know is going to take this job very seriously. He cares deeply about the Parliament of Canada. He cares deeply about uh, about members of Parliament and decorum. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that he has made friends across the aisle um, of all the parties. I think that there's a respect there for him. Um, and I actually think he's going to do fantastic in the job. And, you know, Jagmeet Singh and his words about just the kids and the people who are now going to see a face that might more resemble their own on the halls of Parliament. It's a fantastic day for Canada, you know, after a very troubling time of how we got to this position um, of having to elect a new speaker. Yep, and, and I'm reminded that Peter Milliken was quite a partisan before he became a uh, speaker and served as a Liberal speaker in a Conservative minority government parliamentary sitting. So, you know, and, and Shakir, it, it almost seemed like we might have the reverse of that here because Chris Dontremont looked to have a real shot at, at winning today. And I've got, I want to talk about that in just a second, but what, what's your thoughts on Greg Fergus uh, rising to this office today? Listen, good for him. Uh, obviously, a, a good symbol to, to have a black man as a speaker. I wish him the best. But I think for all the reasons that we've said before, I think the conservatives are going to be a little suspicious. Uh, I don't know the level of trust they're going to have given the previous roles that he's occupied. So we'll see how this all plays itself out. But I would just say when you talk about decorum, uh, a smart colleague of mine who used to work in Parliament Hill said to me, acrimony is a feature of the House. It's not a bug. And I don't know if any speaker is going to actually remove that kind of partisanship and divisiveness that we see today. But again, I wish him the best of luck. You know, uh, Shakir, just to stick with you, it was interesting when, when, when this all happened, because let's face it, this succession was not planned, uh, a lot of Liberals seemed open to Chris uh, Dontremont uh, getting the job. But then on the day that Rhoda quit and he handled question period, and what I'm hearing from inside the Liberal caucus is that when Melissa Lansman called Karina Gould a disgrace and he didn't drop the hammer on Lansman, that may have cost him the opportunity because a lot of Liberals just said, forget it. Uh, they, they felt that it was too much to appease the Conservative side of it. I, I mean, what do you make a, a, of that dynamic and, and how that, you know, the, the defeat of Mr. Dontremont could play into the success or failure of Mr. Ferguson's tenure? Yeah, I mean, interesting. I haven't heard that story. I would say at the end of the day, I always thought a liberal would be the speaker after this vote was said and done. I mean, liberals had caucus this morning. I'm pretty sure they organized their votes for who they wanted to see in that chair, and they, they got the job done. Uh, could have Dutchmont handled that a little a little bit better? Obviously, he could have. But again, I think the conservatives are going to look at Mr. Fergus and see how he handles you know uh, things on the liberal side of the House. And any kind of slip up, he's going to get accused of being partisan, of not being impartial. So I think he needs to be extra careful, uh, given what you've just said about Mr. Dutchmont and handling Mr. Lansman. So, so Brad, on, on this, um, the issue you mentioned the need for greater vetting of, of who gets invited to the gallery mm -hmm. after the, the events that led to this. Does this need to be a full-blown committee investigation into this? I know it's being punted to proc. They're going to look at some of these things sort of backward looking, but do they need a bigger review of how all of this works? That's the nerdiest question I think you've ever yeah, given know, me. What <laughs> committee should this go to? It should but, go but, to or should it even go to committee? It should, like, it should go to PROC, because <laughs> if it doesn't go to PROC, then, then, then what's going to happen is uh, you, you have to let MPs have their say on the matter, even though uh, it's probably not going to be uh, fixed by new, new and more rules. Right. Uh, well, I will, uh, hopefully one day we will find out what truly, what truly did happen and how many people were involved. I know it, I know it wasn't what the, Mr. Polyev says, where it was, it was up to the Prime Minister. He clearly is, yeah. I, I think, misleading Canadians in, 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 in how it all works. Now, just taking a look at the, at the vote today for Mr. Fergus, there were six people that ran for that. And f for the Liberals to make sure that they didn't want the Conservative, there was a New Democrat, there was a Green, um, also running for this, but you really had to make sure you had your votes lined up because it could have gone another way. The, the Liberals were splitting their vote multiple. There was many. There was a right. handful of Liberals uh, running for this. They, they really had to have their ducks in a row. So, so Michelle, do you have any insight on that? Being an old, you know, university buddy of of, of the current speaker, because uh, I was hearing early that uh, kind of the votes were, were split uh, between Mendes and and Fergus, right? Alexander Mendes, who's part of the House leadership team there now, is deputy speaker, I think, or assistant speaker. I can't remember the exact title. Do you have any idea on how it coalesced behind Fergus? Do you have any insight there or any theories? I don't. I don't know the details of how it do, how it happened, but I do know that generally. There's someone who's keeping a very close count 
uh, within the Liberal Party, yeah. probably within the Whip's office. And, you know, these things don't get left to chance. The people in the Whip's office know how to count votes or they're not or they are not in the Whip's office anymore because that's that's their specialty. And so I suspect there might have been a couple of potential outcomes, but I don't think that it, we would ever have gone away from today without a Liberal in that chair, particularly given the um, heightened acrimony that has uh, exists now in the House of Commons, um, that I think that uh, uh, putting somebody in that they think that they can count on to be that calm and level voice um, uh, and that they know well uh, is uh, probably where the Liberal caucus was going to coalesce anyways. And so um, Greg seems like a great choice for that. Right. Okay, uh, Nigan first and, and, and then Shakir, just to sort of close the loop on this. Do, do we think now that they've moved past the process of picking the new speaker, Nigan, that this puts an end to the story and the narrative about Yaroslav Hunka and why he was in the gallery and the fallout and the controversy there and now Parliament moves on or does that story still have legs? Uh, no, I think it continues. Um... I uh, just want to add something to what was said a minute ago. I mean, don't forget that the block votes sure. uh, and how important they felt for Greg Fergus's yeah. uh, election. I mean, I think there's a role there and there's certainly a story that might be worth thinking about. Um, getting back to what you just asked me, which is uh, this doesn't put it away. This doesn't close the chapter on the issue involving who gets to sit and who gets to get to be invited by the speaker to come to events like when you invite the Ukrainian prime minister or the president. Um, the, the reality is that this story is not going to go away because it has legs. It has all the different features that Pierre Polyev wants when it comes to uh, pointing out the alleged corruption or alleged uh, mismanagement or inability, ineffectiveness, and so on. It, it paints all the pictures for Pierre Polyev, but it won't be the lead story. Uh, and so moving the, right. away from the speaker and moving into a new position, especially with this, such a historic occasion, and then on top of that, for the what we talked about just a minute ago, the potential election of the first First Nations pre Prime Premier, it's going to be turned into page six, seven, eight, and I think it will begin to fade away on uh, this story, and it won't certainly have the legs that it had about 24 hours ago. Okay, page six, seven, and eight for the kids watching. He's talking about a newspaper, which is a physical thing that you used to be able to buy. Shakir, uh, what, what, what's your take? Oh, come on. on, 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 oh, come on. Whether this is the, <laughs> I get it, I get it, buddy. It's had a lot. Uh, Shakir, uh, your quick final thoughts okay. on this one. Fourth segment, fifth yeah, segment. I think, it, <laughs> I, I think it closes the chapter on this, but I, I think as this goes to committee, uh, you know the Conservatives are going to be looking for was PMO yeah. involved in any way? Did they drop the ball? They're going to try to make that connection. But if it is all just Anthony Rota or his chief of staff kind of dropped the ball on this, it really closes the book on this and people move forward, talk about affordability, housing, et cetera, what we were talking about prior to this.